So uh, I'm going to begin with an overview. I'll show you a, a schedule of the topics in the moment that we're going to cover in the schedule. Um, but the uh, main thing is that we are working jointly on a revised reconstruction of old Chinese. Uh, both of us have worked on it before, but uh, we have, uh, we're continuing, we think, to make some progress. Uh, the uh, business about the software metaphor is that uh, rather than wait until we're, we're finished, which would probably be uh, after we're dead, um, we decided that it would be most useful if we released uh, uh, versions as we believe we find have come across a stable version of the system uh, so that people can at least uh, use what we think we know uh, so far. And so the uh, upcoming versions will have higher numbers and will incorporate bug fixes. Uh, uh, hopefully we solving problems in the uh, system that we have so far. Actually, hang on, I'm going to have to do something here. Uh, uh, I meant to have the time showing here. Is it still? Yes, okay. Right. Um, so uh, version 1.0 will be released soon. Uh, you know what that means if you hear it from Microsoft, but uh, uh, the, what we plan to release, and uh, well, I'll just say soon, is uh, an introduction to the system, a reasonably concise introduction uh, that, uh, well, it's shorter than my book anyway, um, and uh, in both Chinese and English versions and uh, reconstructions for several thousand uh, uh, Chinese, uh, old Chinese forms. Uh, we have a database, which actually I can uh, show you. Uh, uh, we use a database which is actually based on Gramata Serica Recensa Cargren's uh, dictionary, but it's, uh, uh, he wouldn't recognize it. Um, and uh, this is, uh, located on a remote server. I, I go into these details because if you're involved in a collaborative project, you might want to know this, how to do this, because uh, it's very convenient. Uh, the, the database itself is on a remote server at the University of Michigan, uh, and uh, both of us can access the same copy of the database uh, remotely from anywhere in the world. We've done it from lots of places in the world. Um, and so once it's updated, it, one of us decides to update it, we update it in real time. Um, and so uh, there's only, we don't have the problem of synchronizing different copies of the database. Uh, I won't go into the details, but the idea is that uh, once uh, Laurent and I have both uh, uh, said a form is okay, then the, that will be ready to, that's more or less ready for the public. Go back here. Okay, so here's the schedule of topics for uh, the next three days. Um, uh, it's slightly modified possibly from what, you sent, what we sent you. Uh, this morning I will be giving you an overview which includes uh, sort of our basic principles and some of the historical background and uh, how we got to the point we are now. Uh, and then this afternoon Laurent will be giving a, a presentation on word structure and root structure and sort of the, the hypotheses about morphology. Uh, we expect to have a, uh, at least we've set aside an hour of discussion time after each uh, presentation and so uh, uh, keep notes of things that you want to uh, discuss in that time. I, I hope that that will be uh, a, a useful part of the, of the uh, summer school. Then uh, tomorrow, uh, we'll talk, uh, Laurent will talk about the beginning of the syllable and I will talk about the end. Uh, on uh, Wednesday, I'm going to show you some of the reasons we think we're on the right track. That is to say, not just describing our system, but trying to persuade you that, uh, that the uh, modifications we've made and the, the hypotheses that we're working with are productive. And then uh, in the afternoon, Laurent will talk about the implications for Sino-Tibetan and beyond, um, on beyond Sino-Tibetan. But uh, 
that's more or less it. And uh, today is the overview. So the overview of the overviews, now here's what I'm going to talk about this morning, uh, general principles, uh, the kinds of evidence uh, that exist for old Chinese, for reconstructing old Chinese. Um, uh, now Laurent uh, sent a message out that it would it's helpful to have a background, at least some knowledge of the middle Chinese system to understand what's going on. And if you uh, have not had a chance to read my, uh, uh, it's chapter two of my book is on the website for this uh, summer school and uh, that describes the notation for middle Chinese. There are a few modifications which I'll show you, but otherwise I think it, it still stands. Um, and uh, describe our notation, talk about the historical background, how re Old Chinese Reconstruction got to where it is, uh, and uh, then what's new in version 0.97. So I begin with the question of what is Old Chinese? Um, actually, in the book, in my book in 1992, I used a, in a narrow sense, as the ancestor of all attested forms of Chinese. Now, uh, you might think it would be more appropriate to call this proto-Chinese rather than old Chinese. Uh, it's partly a matter of just the micro-tradition of the field. In Chinese, it's called Shanguyin or Shanggu Uh And in fact, it's not too different from the language of the earliest uh, Chinese texts, which uh, connected texts uh, uh, which date from the 11th century. We do have oracle bone texts from before that, but they're rather difficult to use for this kind of research because of the limited uh, vocabulary. But in a broader sense, uh, uh, Old Chinese, you can think of Old Chinese as the Chinese of the Old Chinese period, which you can more or less arbitrarily say is the pre-Qin period before the unification of China in 221. So we would really like to describe everything that happens in that time interval. Uh, so that'll show you how ambitious we are. Next uh, question, what is a reconstruction anyway? And I'd like to call attention to two uh, views. One is a traditional positivist view, which uh, I think has been uh, rather influential in historical linguistics. Um, the idea is that a reconstruction is a set of proven assertions about a language established by applying a scientific procedure or method uh, to the data. This is a very common way of thinking about science in the 19th century that, uh, uh, anyway, I won't go into the, to the details. Uh, our own view is quite different. We take a hypothetical deductive uh, view. Uh, we are making a, a reconstruction for us as a set of hypotheses about a dead language. Uh, hypotheses are testable but they're not provable. In other words, we, we cannot uh, tell you that we have proved that Old Chinese has this form any more than Newton could have told you that he had proved his law of universal gravitation, which turned out later to have a few, uh, to need a few modifications. Um, and uh, hypotheses don't have to be uh, derived from a, following a particular sequence of steps uh, and applying a particular method to the data. Hypotheses can come from anywhere, you know, tea leaves, uh, uh, bad dreams, uh, uh, anything, but uh, the crucial thing is that they, and the thing that makes it scientific is that they must be tested empirically. Uh, and that's the, that's the crux of the matter. So uh, consequences of our views, if you see a reconstruction as a set of hypotheses, uh, the best way of characterizing different <coughs> reconstructions and the differences between them is probably to identify the hypotheses embodied in the reconstruction. Uh, just looking at the uh, written forms uh, often gives you a wrong impression because uh, reconstructions with very similar uh, assumptions or hypotheses can have very different notations or uh, and things like that. So that's just uh, a small note there. So what does a reconstruction include? Uh, well, uh, it depends on what you think a language includes, and I would submit that a, uh, a language is a set of linguistic signs. Uh, each sign has not two, but three sets of properties. 
uh, pronunciation and the semantic value, but also uh, a set of morphosyntactic properties. Uh, the morphosyntactic properties uh, tell how the sign combines with other signs to form more complex signs. Uh, what are the properties of the resulting signs? So when you put uh, words together to form a phrase or sentence, we consider the phrase or sentence a, a, a linguistic sign also, uh, whose uh, meaning and uh, pronunciation are determined by the, the signs which compose it. So we want to reconstruct everything. Uh, not just the phonology, but the semantics and the morphosyntax as well. I might say not just the phonological system either, but we would like to know how each lexical item is encoded using that phonological system. So it's not, we're not through when we give you the table of initials and finals and so forth. Uh, and not just a single old Chinese stage, but really all the subsequent stages too. That is, we want to have a, a satisfactory history of the Chinese language. And uh, we're not reconstructing, uh, we're not aiming to reconstruct an idealized system, sort of a platonic uh, version of old Chinese, but uh, we want to include all of the diversity in uh, time and space that was actually there in the language as it was uh, spoken. So here are some of our principles. The first is, uh, I, I think if you can see that if you uh, want to do this much, uh, reconstruction has to be a group effort. Uh, we have to uh, enlist the help of paleographers, early text specialists, and specialists in related languages. Uh, and uh, this is another tip if for uh, collaborative work. I think um, some collaborations uh, don't produce results, or good results, partly because uh, it, in order for it to work, each person has to be willing to learn a little bit about the other person's area. You can't just seal it off and say, okay, that's your department, I don't care about that. Uh, you really can't have a conversation unless you have uh, worked a little bit on the other person's areas outside your own. Uh, the other thing, and I think this is, I don't, this uh, somehow came to us late, uh, but a reconstruction is always incomplete. It is, it's always going to be partial information about uh, old Chinese. So I said we want to reconstruct everything, but not everything can be reconstructed because information has been lost over time. So it's inherent in reconstructions that there will be unanswered questions or uh, maybe a segment in a word which we can't identify with certainty, and we have uh, incorporated that into the notation. And But of course, you hope that even though it's, it's incomplete, it will get less incomplete as time goes on and you will be able to answer in the future, some of the questions which you have to leave open for the present. And that's, again, the reason for the software uh, version metaphor. Uh, so we have explicitly, uh, tried explicitly to indicate uh, where we have incomplete information in our uh, reconstructions. Now, some people actually, uh, this is, it's not un unheard of to do this, of course, but uh, we've tried to be rather careful about it. Um, but I find, actually, there's always a temptation if you're doing reconstruction, if you've got more than one choice, you, you say, oh, it's probably that one. And then you go on with it as, you think you go on with the reconstruction you sort of picked. Um, it may turn out later that that was a mistake and uh, it's much better to know uh, which things you have information for at any given time. So we have... Uh, uh, a couple of notations for incomplete information. Parentheses indicate the uh, items which may or may not have been present. And just because it's there doesn't mean that there's any positive reason to believe it's there. Uh, for example, this word yi, uh, Middle Chinese, this, uh, when you see, does that show on? Yes. Um, this is our uh, typable notation for Middle Chinese, which I'll come back to. Uh, any forms which have an asterisk in front of them are reconstructed Old Chinese. And so this is our reconstruction for this item, as it turns out. Uh, but the R is in parentheses. The reason is that for this particular type of syllable, uh, usually we cannot tell whether an R was there or not. If there was an R there or if there wasn't an R there, the result in Middle Chinese would be the same. Sometimes we have clues, but in this particular case we don't have any clues that would tell us whether there's an R there or not. So um, 
I, I mean, I've been advised that it's, this is a lot of trouble and uh, why don't you just leave the R out unless you think it, there's some reason for it to be there. But you might miss something. I mean, there might be another form that does have an R that you discover is related to this form and so forth. So uh, again, it doesn't necessarily w mean we believe that there's an R there. It just means that there could be an R there. Then we have a square bracket rule. When we have something in square brackets, it, uh, an X in square brackets, that means it's either Old Chinese X or it's something with the same Middle Chinese reflex as Old Chinese X. Uh, as you'll see, we often have a number of different uh, sources for the same thing in Middle Chinese, uh, that, and we can't always choose among them, and so this is our, our uh, notation for when we can't do that. Uh, more principles. Uh, make hy explicit hypotheses about morphology. Uh, actually, uh, this, the story here goes back to uh, Laurent's uh, uh, review of my 1992 book in which his main criticism was that the, uh, there was no explicit theory of what a Chinese, an old Chinese root was like and what the affixes could be uh, added to it. Uh, and, that, and that's perfectly true, and I think that was a shortcoming and something that needs to be done. This actually, um, well, re reconstructing old Chinese at this point is hard. I mean, it's gonna, it takes a lot of work, uh, it takes a lot of investigation, but one of the clues is uh, morphological connect connections, or possible morphological connections, and we make use of that, as you will see. The second point is take paleography seriously and don't treat uh, phonetic series as a static system. Uh, when Carl Grin wrote his uh, Grammata Serica and the later Grammata Serica Recensa, um, he mentions that he explicitly, he, he excludes from the dictionary any character forms that did not survive into the modern, into the, the standard script later. Um, well, by doing so, he excluded some of the most important evidence about what the phonology of the earlier period was like. Uh, that's very interesting stuff. And, uh, but it has not been uh, routine for old Chinese uh, researchers, pe people trying to reconstruct old Chinese to uh, get involved in all of these uh, 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 messy texts and things. Dong uh, for example, uh, uh, Used the simply used the Shuo Wen Jie Zi as a basis, um, and uh, uh, I mean, Dong Tonghe was a brilliant uh, uh, man who uh, uh, you know, contributed a lot. But I think that was a mistake. I mean, well, it wasn't necessary. It was something that we would hope to get past uh, eventually. And we don't want to shrink from the diversity in, in time and space, as I've mentioned, of early Chinese. So. Uh, we assume that early, early Chinese was probably at least as diverse uh, linguistically as, uh, as Chinese is today. Um, and uh, this is inevitably going to affect uh, how texts are written in one area as compared to another area. Uh, and uh, there's going to be a certain amount of dialect mixture in the, in the language as a result. Uh, we don't want to just say, well, it's probably a dialect, but we, so when we make a proposal about dialects, uh, we do everything we can to locate the, the actual isoglosses uh, and tell, so we can have some evidence that one place did it one way and another place did it another way. Uh, and of course, we want to know not just what the old Chinese, the earliest system was, but also how it developed. Um, so let's turn to kinds of evidence for Old Chinese. Uh, these are the things that, these two things are always mentioned, that is the rhymes in early Chinese poetry, mainly the Shi Jing, or the Book of uh, Odes, and also the phonetic compounds, or Xie Sheng Zi, which make up uh, over 90% of the Chinese uh, script. Um, sometimes it is not mentioned, but it is crucial uh, to use the Middle Chinese pronunciation system uh, which dates from the rhyme books of the 5th and 6th uh, century, around about, about that time, um, uh, CE. And uh, one of the constraints on a, on a reconstruction system that we accept is that we have to be able to account for what the Middle Chinese form is. 
uh, and that may seem obvious, but it's, it's sometimes not mentioned, it's sometimes uh, implicit. Now, it's often assumed, I find, that uh, if you have this information on the word, as if you know that what the rhyme is, and you know what the phonetic series is, and you know what the middle Chinese pronunci pronunciation is, then you ought to be able to give the reconstruct an old Chinese reconstruction for the form. Uh, and for example, I uh, was shown a, uh, a handbook of old Chinese pronunciation by, uh, I guess, by Guo Xiliang. Uh, every character that occurs in early texts, I, I imagine, was in there. And there was a fully spelled out pronunciation for every one of those characters. And that's simply impossible. Uh, that would mean that no information has been lost. And that's, uh, that's just not the way it works. So it's not just a, a mechanical determinative process that you take these three kinds of information and then run it through some kind of a black box and you get your uh, old Chinese reconstruction out of it. Uh, there are always, well, if you're doing it right, there are going to be questions that, that are not going to be able, are not going to be answerable because the information has been lost. So we reject that view. So in addition to those three kinds of evidence that I mentioned, um, other important kinds of evidence which we uh, are uh, using and attempting to use, uh, first is so-called word families. Um, now, um, personally, I'm not too fond of the expression word families because um, uh, a lot of people uh, find what they think is a set of related words and they don't go any further in, in the analysis than that. They just say, oh, well, all these words belong to a word family. Um, or uh, is another word for it, right? Uh, related words. Um, but uh, if you're going to be explicit about the morphology, it's not enough to say what, uh, that two words are related. You need to identify the root, what they have in common, uh, and the affixes that distinguish them or maybe it's, uh, it could be dialect differences or something like that. But that's what we mean by an explicit morphology, is uh, to uh, identify the root, identify the aff affixes. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, another thing, curiously, which has not been included in, uh, traditionally in uh, reconstructions of Old Chinese, is the uh, Min dialects, that is the Fujian dialect. Now, uh, it is uh, known, uh, very, uh, with great clarity, that these dialects preserve distinctions which were, had been lost in the Middle Chinese system. Um, I can give you examples if you're interested later. Uh, now, one exception to this trend is uh, Sergei Starostin in his uh, reconstruction attempted to include at least some of the uh, distinctions in Min uh, that were not, uh, uh, that you can't get from Middle Chinese. Uh, but the, the, especially the, uh, the onsets of the, in the Min family are extremely complex. You have, uh, in addition to the usual array, you have a set of so-called softened uh, initials, uh, which are probably indications of something, some kind of prefixation. And, uh, and this is a, a valuable uh, uh, piece of information or, or a body of evidence about what old Chinese was like, unless you think that Min, Min people wandered off from in from somewhere else and something, or they're not really Chinese. It's clearly a variety of Chinese, and, and it's clearly in the Chinese family. But so it needs to be taken account of in uh, old Chinese. But that has not been uh, traditional. Uh, another kind of evidence uh, is uh, loan words to or from Chinese. Both uh, things occur. There's a lot of Chinese vocabulary in Tsai Kadai, Viet Nung, uh, Hmong Mian, and so forth, various uh, neighboring language families. Uh, some of those, some of that vocabulary is quite early and uh, is also gives us a peek at least before Middle Chinese as to what was going on. Um, there also are a few loan words, at least, from other languages into Chinese from Tibeto-Burman, uh, Tocharian, for example, Austroasiatic, probably the word Jiang for the uh, uh, Changjiang, uh, Xingnu, whatever that was, uh, 
uh, their Xingnu words uh, uh, in Chinese texts. And maybe sort of overlapping with this category is early transcriptions in Chinese of other languages or in other languages of Chinese. Uh, as long if they're early enough in date, then they can help us uh, get uh, back to old Chinese. Uh, what about Tibeto-Burman? Uh, we get asked this some, sometimes, uh, is, is, is it cheating to look at Tibeto-Burman, or, or how much do you use Tibeto-Burman in reconstructing uh, Old Chinese? Well, the simple answer, I guess, is we don't use it at all, but that's not quite true. Uh, here's what we don't do. Uh, we don't ever infer a distinction from in Old Chinese based on a distinction in Tibeto-Burman. And if to do that would be to confuse uh, Old Chinese with Sino-Tibetan. Uh, because, of course, it's quite possible that there are things in, distinctions in Tibeto-Burman which are not represented in Old Chinese. However, getting hypotheses from peeking at, at Tibeto-Burman languages is perfectly okay. Remember, it's okay to get hypotheses from anywhere. You know, you can buy one on the street down there if you like. And uh, so, for example, uh, we see that Tibeto-Burman languages have, many of them have a final R. So we think, hmm, is it, is, uh, there's some reason to believe that Chinese had a final R? And it turns out that there is. Uh, we don't decide on the basis of Tibeto-Burman which words had R and which words had N. Uh, we, only, we restrict ourselves to Chinese evidence, and that's what keeps us honest in this re regard. Um, so, let's see. So, more about Middle Chinese? Right. Um, any questions up to this point, or quick questions, or shall I? As I say, I reserve the right to postpone answering them, but... Uh, Okay, well that, that was basically the, the very quick overview of what Old Chinese is about. And, and since Middle Chinese is one of the main kinds of evidence about Old Chinese, uh, I'm going to talk about Middle Chinese for a while. Middle Chinese is a system of pronunciation of Chinese from about the 6th century CE, uh, and it is recorded in great detail. This is a, a, very, a remarkable uh, set of data. Uh, there's a, there was a dictionary, the Che Yun, published in 601, uh, which is organized by rhymes. It, actually, it was organized by tone class first, and then with each tone class, it's divided into rhymes, and with each, within each rhyme, it's divided into groups of homonyms. Um, and then each homonym group has a, a phonetic spelling in the Fan Che system, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, another important resource is the Jingdian Shu one, which is not a dictionary, but it's a commentary uh, on 13 classical texts, which basically, in the order in which they appear in the texts, uh, gives you what apparently the author considered to be difficult words or words which might uh, pose some difficulty to the reader, uh, especially cases where there might be more than one pronunciation, uh, to know which pronunciation occurs in a particular context. Now, we can't assume that this is always uh, correct. I mean, he was a long way from the old Chinese period also. But it is a very valuable resource, and he also has fan chess spellings. Uh, and the thing he has, which, or, or the Jingyan Shuwen has, which uh, Che Yun does not have, is lots of examples in context that allow you to see uh, what the reading practice was at, in the sixth century, or one reading practice. So. Um, let me say a little bit more about Fanche spellings. I'll run over it quickly. Uh, they these two uh, sources specify Middle Chinese pronunciations by giving what's called Fanche spellings. Uh, Fanche, I think that Carlgren translated it as uh, turning and cutting. Uh, but the point is that uh, the pronunciation of one character is indicated by giving two other characters, one of which in uh, represents has the same initial consonant as the word you're trying to spell, and the second has everything else the same as the word you're trying to spell. So if you take the beginning of the first and put it together with the second part of the second, uh, then you have an idea of what the uh, pronunciation is. Here's an example. This is uh, from a, uh, actually a manuscript of an edition of the Che Yun that appeared, that's dated 706. Uh, at, uh, I'll say a little bit more about that. This is the very first entry in this in the Che Yun. It's the word Dong, the one, 
up here means that it is the first rhyme group in the in that uh, tone category. The tone category is ping, uh, and then uh, it just says de uh, hung fan. Okay, so that the fun, the two characters of a fan chess spelling are either follow, usually either followed by fan or qie in the Guangyun, which is a later version. They're followed by qie, but in the uh, uh, Cheyun manuscripts we have that's indicated by fan. So it says Dong De Hung Fan. So uh, the De is the initial speller. I've given here in the box our uh, Middle Chinese uh, notation for these pronunciations. Uh, so De begins with a T and Hung ends with this thing we write U-W-N-G. And so that means that the uh, pronunciation of dung is what we write as T-U-W-N-G. Uh, notice, by the way, that the Fanches speller spelling doesn't work for modern Mandarin. If you tried to follow modern Mandarin, you would come up not with dung, but with dung, right? Because uh, there's been a tone split in, in uh, Pingsheng has split into two tones. And so you would often come out with the right with the wrong tone or something else wrong. And in fact, there is in Chinese such a thing as a, a spelling pronunciation, a fanche spelling pronunciation. Uh, you're probably accustomed to thinking of this as something that happens in alphabetic scripts, but uh, uh, if a person, if someone takes a fanche spelling and interprets it in, anachronistically by putting together the, the modern values of the initial and the Final, then they can come up with an apparently irregular form. Well, it is an irregular form. Uh, one of those, for instance, is uh, this is pointed out by Zhao uh, Yuanren uh, is the word Mian uh, Chang, the Chang, this Chang in third tone. Uh, it's, uh, well, I won't go into the details, but it, it, if it followed the rules, it should be Jiang. But uh, it doesn't, uh, what somebody did is they took the initial speller, which happened to be a Pingsheng word, and therefore had an aspirate initial, and, uh, and then the, se the second speller was a Shangsheng word, which happened to not have a voice obstruent initial, and so didn't change to Chusheng, and so forth. And if you didn't follow that, don't worry about it. But uh, anyway, so there is such a thing as a spelling pronunciation in Chinese. Uh, just. The rest of the entry, uh, it, this is sort of interesting. The dung is uh, uh, de defined as mu fang, the direction of wood. Well, that's part of the wu xing theory, the theory of the five phases or elements, uh, and each direction is associated with one uh, of these uh, elements. East is uh, associated with wood. And uh, there are five directions, just like there are five elements. There's north, south, east, west, and middle is the fifth direction. Um, but so that's what that's about. And then uh, here, at the end of the of the first character in the homophone uh, group, there is a, a number which indicates how many characters uh, there are in the in the group which have that same pronunciation. So if the little dividing line between the homonym groups isn't clear, you can usually count from this number and find out when another one begins. Um, so the Cheyun itself, uh, the preface is dated 601, um, but uh, that, that, as far as we know, is not extant. There's some fragments that's not exactly clear which, uh, from Dunhuang, it's not exactly clear which versions they represent. Um, uh, and so traditionally, the Guangyun, which is a Song Dynasty uh, revision of the Cheyun, is used as a surrogate for the Cheyun. So sometimes when people are speaking about the Cheyun, they're actually talking about the Guangyun. Um, the Guangyun has uh, much longer uh, definitions, and it has their characters have been added uh, that weren't there. Um, for the most part, not without exception, but for the most part, it preserves very faithfully the uh, fun the Funche spellings of the, the pronunciation system of the Cheyun. And so it's not such a bad idea to use this. I did find one case where for 20 years I had been reconstructing a character wrong because it was wrong. It was different in the Guangyun than in the Cheyun. It's actually the word rhyme itself, Yun. Uh, I won't go into the details. Uh, I'm, this is just a small edition of the Guangyun if you've never looked at it. 
you might want to flip through, you'll see there are five uh, Zhuan. Uh, there's a Shang Ping, Xia Ping, which has no phonological significance, it's just that there were so many Ping Shang words that they had to be split into two Zhuan. And then there's a Zhuan for Shang Sheng, Qi Sheng, and Ru Sheng. And then inside that there are, are uh, uh, rhymes and common common groups. Now, what I the the image that I just showed you uh, of Dung is actually taken from a manuscript that was discovered in 1947, a nearly complete manuscript of an edition of 706 was found in the former palace in Beijing, in the Forbidden City. It's just one of these things. I guess somebody opened the door that they hadn't opened for. Uh, several hundred years or something, and there it was. Uh, kind of thing that happens at the Vatican, too, I guess. Um, and it's called the Kang Myo Bu Chue Chie Yun by a guy named Wang Ren Xu. Uh, means Chie Yun with uh, errors corrected and uh, uh, missing things uh, uh, inserted. So, what do we actually mean by Middle Chinese? Uh, what I've been talking about, and when I say Middle Chinese, I'm talking about early Middle Chinese, which is a system of pronunciation that's indicated in these uh, 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 sources that I've mentioned. Now, there's also uh, another kind of uh, phonological uh, work, the, the rhyme tables, which are arrange syllables in tabular format. Uh, these are from a later period, and one of Pulleyblank's, uh, Ted Pulleyblank's uh, major contributions, I think, was to clarify that there was a difference between early Middle Chinese, which was represented in the rhyme books, and, and late Middle Chinese, which is represented in the, uh, in the rhyme tables, which come at a later time. Carlgren really thought that they were both all representing more or less the same system, uh, and it's very clear now that that's not true. Um, now, I've, I don't think I've been, I may have slipped and said Middle Chinese phonology, but I've been trying to say Middle Chinese pronunciation because this is, we, we can't assume that this is actually re representing uh, uh, colloquial speech. Probably the intention was that the, the uh, pronunciations were supposed to indicate how you were supposed to uh, read the character when you were reciting a classical text. That would have been the I think the thing that would be considered more important. Now, that doesn't mean that they didn't include colloquial words. They probably did, but but uh, we we mustn't think be it would be anachronistic to think that this is simply a, a phonological description of a Chinese dialect of a particular place. Uh, it also seems to conflate at least two two or more slightly different varieties of pronunciation, and there are a lot of cross references in the books. There are a lot of words which are uh, pronounced, uh, which are placed in more than one place in the book. So it is not necessarily a single synchronic system in the linguistic sense, um, and doesn't necessarily represent the language of any particular place. So is it okay to use this? Does this sort of poison it uh, for our purposes? And the reason I raised the question is, or one of the reasons, is uh, Jerry Norman and South Coblin uh, wrote a paper which uh, criticized uh, the over-reliance on Middle Chinese sources, on these uh, written documents for Middle Chinese rhyme books and things like that. Uh, and you have the reference there. This, by the way, is, uh, this will be put on, or is it already on the website? Which one? My presentation. Uh, this one is, yes, not, yeah. not the Okay. So this will be on the website. You can take a look at it there. Um, um, now, their critique, uh, in, in my opinion, applies mostly to using the Cheyun system, or the Middle Chinese system, as a framework for dialectology. And on that point, I think uh, Laurent and I agree with them. That is, it has been traditional in uh, Chinese dialectology when you're describing a dialect to simply show how it corresponds, ha what happened to each of the categories of, uh, of the Cheyun, or Middle Chinese. Uh, the problem with that is that uh, it, it may, the dialect may not be especially close to that, and it gives you no sense of which dialects are, or what the relationship uh, is be between one dialect and another dialect. Uh, it simply tells you what the relationship is between that dialect and this uh, possibly somewhat artificial system of pronunciation. Uh, so it, it's not a good way to do dialectology, they're quite right about that. 
Uh, and basically, it's the reason is that the rhyme books can't predict the future. The rhyme books can't tell you anything new about uh, what happened after the rhyme books were written. Uh, so they're not books of prophecy, as I sometimes say. But they're indispensable and fairly reliable for studying the past. And the fact that they don't represent necessarily a single synchronic system of phonology is not a huge obstacle. Actually, it, what it means is probably that some of the reconstruction has already been done for us. That is, some distinctions have been established on the basis of, of, of different dialects at any one time. And it would be crazy, in, in my opinion, to try to uh, work on Old Chinese without using this extremely rich resource and detailed resource. Uh, so, uh, on to notation for Middle Chinese. Uh, the Middle Chinese uh, notation we're using now is a slight modification of the system that's in my handbook in 1992. That's the one that's described in, uh, in Chapter 2, which is on the website. Um, I'll tell you what the modifications are in a moment. Uh, it is not a reconstruction. Um, uh, Pulley Blank, uh, for years, has tried to accuse me of sneaking this in as a, as a reconstruction without taking responsibility for it, but for the reasons that I just described, uh, we don't necessarily think this is a, a synchronic uh, uh, phonological system anyway. Uh, some of these categories were probably pronounced one way in one place and another way in another place, and so um, uh, I think that stage of the language should probably be reconstructed with the help of, uh, you know, in large part with the comparative method from uh, modern dialects and also from later documents. Um, but it is not a reconstruction, and that is why uh, I feel comfortable in using just ASCII letters, uh, that you'll see in a moment. So what it is intended to be is an alphabetic notation for the information that is present in the Middle Chinese sources. Uh, middle Chinese uh, classification in Fanche spellings, it's very uh, intricate and very uh, uh, rich, but it's not very intuitive. If you just see that this word is has this Fanche spelling and this word has this Fanche spelling, it's very difficult to sort of see at a glance how the two words uh, differ. Um, so I, I'm really, I really recommend the uh, uh, this notation, we found it to be very useful. So, features, it includes ASCII characters only. Now, in the book, uh, in chapter two, I describe a typable version of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the notation used in the book. Actually, uh, the phonetic symbols in the Middle Chinese notation in the book were added at the request of the uh, editors. I didn't think it was a good idea, but I was, uh, uh, they had me over a barrel, uh, and uh, <laughs> so I, I, sure, go ahead, whatever. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, so I always wanted a really typable notation. Um, the advantages of this are that everybody recognizes ASCII characters and can tell one from another. Even so much as a schwa, I have found that people have, and non-specialists often have difficulty reproducing it. They look at it and they think it's an E, or they'll write it as a mirror image of an E instead of a 180 degree rotation of an E, or something else will go wrong. So uh, this is easy for non-specialists to use. Um, it is also very convenient for computer use. So if you can put it in an email, no problem. Uh, searching the database, uh, well, the database that I showed you, uh, all of our middle Chinese entries are in this notation uh, so that we can uh, we just type right ahead. We don't have to do anything about special characters, and we can search. We just use it uh, search by the uh, ASCII characters. Now, it is, the pulley blank was a little bit right to some extent, because where there is general agreement, or where it's fairly clear what the sound was uh, in Middle Chinese, and there are some plenty of cases where it's pretty much uncontroversial, uh, then I have chosen letters that would be suitable for that. Um, so where there is wide agreement on what the pronunciation, a particular element of pronunciation is, then I, uh, I put in the, uh, the letter that would, more, that would uh, evoke that. Um, but there are also controversial issues, uh, and such as how to interpret the so-called chunyo uh, doublets in uh, the intricate pop problem in the rhyme books. Um, and we 
leave that, those questions open. The, the uh, notation for those is fairly artificial. Uh, it might be close to something that's correct, but we're certainly not claiming that that's the analysis of, uh, that we would uh, uh, want to agree on. Again, it's not even clear that, they, that analysis is possible. I mean, what is it we would be analyzing? I mean, what phonological system is it? And so we recommend it. I mean, uh, this is uh, if you want to transcribe a tongue poem, if you want to show students how a tongue poem sounded well, it's, it's pre tongue, so it's a little extra information, but uh, um, it's uh, very useful. And uh, this system was what is uh, standardly used by all Chinese uh, commentators on texts. Uh, uh, the commentaries on uh, early texts that were done in the Tang Dynasty. If they want to indicate a pronunciation, they'll indicate it with a fan chest spelling, which more or less represents this same system. And so if you do not have, know how to use that or don't know what those things mean, uh, it's very difficult to get make full use of the commentarial literature. Uh, for example, uh, sometimes uh, the same character can be read in uh, ping sheng or chu sheng, two, two different tones. And if it's a ping sheng, often it's a noun, and if it's chu sheng, it's a verb or vice versa. So uh, if, you see, if you can interpret the fan chest spelling in the commentary, you can tell at least what that commentary thought, commentator thought of the grammatical category of the word was. You can see whether he interpreted it as a verb or as a noun, because those, those uh, things were tradi traditional. Okay, this is just, uh, I couldn't get all of the initial consonants on one slide. Uh, this is all in the chapter two. I'm not going to spend much time on it. It is useful in uh, phonology to distinguish between grave initials and acute initials. Those are terms from uh, Jakobson and uh, Howley, but uh, in more modern terminology, that grave means non coronal and acute means coronal. Uh, so these are the grave initials. Uh, the reason is. Uh, Vowels do, tend to develop slightly differently in, in these two environments, depending on whether the initial is grave or acute. And then here are the uh, coronal initials. Uh, I'll, I'll mention some of the features of the notation. Uh, one thing which is a little bit unfortunate, initial H is, it actually represents a voiced sound, which is called xiamu. Uh, no, there was no good uh, substitute. Uh, so uh, huang, uh, yellow, is H-W-A-N-G. Uh, and it was probably actually something like Huang or Huang, something like that. Uh, but uh, there's no letter for <laughs> so that's what I did. And the voiceless uh, fricative is, is written with an X. Uh, there's also a distinction in traditional phonology between uh, uh, the, the H, which I write in first, second, and fourth division, from the one that I write in uh, third division. Uh, and uh, but you can tell that that's called uh, yunmu or yusan. There are two two terms for it, uh, and you can tell you can identify that it's yunmu by looking at at the uh, uh, to see if the H has later in the syllable if there's a, an I or a J in front of the vowel. If so, then it's the traditional yunmu. So you can tell uh, if you know the rules. You can tell at a glance what the traditional Chinese initial would be on the basis of the, of the, of the uh, Middle Chinese notation. You can also tell what rhyme it would be in uh, and things like that and what division and all of that. So the information in these uh, early sources is uh, extractable from the, uh, in a fairly transparent way from the, from the notation. Uh, y is an initial is just like ya. Um, there is a uh, uh, if it uh, follows a consonant, however, it indicates a palatal articulation. So, uh, yeah, Y E P for leaf is was probably something like yep. Uh, er was probably nip, and jun was probably jin, something like that. Uh, so the Y is a typable uh, indication uh, of palatal pronunciation. H indicates aspiration. R indicates a retroflexion. Uh, now, in, I used a barred I in my book, uh, but it turns out that uh, it's very difficult uh, to distinguish a barred I from a regular I, especially in a pirated uh, Xerox of the book. Um, and so uh, this turns out to be somewhat uh, 
uh, inconvenient, so we simply use a plus sign uh, as a mnemonic, and we substitute an apostrophe for the glottal stop. Um, actually, you could leave the apostrophe out, it would cause no uh, 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 confusion, but I mean, it's redundant in fact, but it, it, we put it anyway because it corresponds to the yin mu of uh, traditional phonology. The one other change that we've made, well, it's not just that, uh, is that uh, there's this one rhyme which, we, which I had written as epsilon barred I, or W epsilon barred I, this ja rhyme, and we leave the barred I off now there. It probably uh, is a better indication of the pronunciation in, many, in some cases anyway, so we write those as EA and WEA now. Uh, there's a special spelling rule, I'm afraid. Uh, it, this is mostly for aesthetic reasons. Uh, uh, really, you, the way it's usually analyzed, yeah, consists of the initial Y plus the final yep. But rather than y, writing Y, J, E, P, uh, you just write Y. So if there's a, a J in the, at the beginning of the final you attach, you just leave the J out if, there's a, if, it, if it follows a Y in the initial constant. And it, anyway, I've gotten used to it. I haven't gotten a lot of complaints about it. Um, now, in Middle Chinese syllables, this was a distinction that will turn out to be important in reconstructing Old Chinese. Um, there are tr three, four traditional categories, based, actually based on the rhyme book, the rhyme tables rather than on the rhyme books, but they work for the rhyme uh, books as well. Uh, between e dung, r dung, san dung, and si dung. Well, e, r, and si, one, two, and four, are what we call type A syllables, and uh, three is what we, are what we call type B syllables. And this two you can read off if you know the rule. You can read off from looking at the syllable the way it's uh, written. So if it has a vowel A, O, or U, and there's no J or Y in front, then it's division one. All of the division two words have either EA or AE. Uh, and if it has one of those without, again, without a Y or J in front, then it's division two. Uh, if it has the vowel E, all of the four, the, the Sidang words uh, have the same main vowel uh, E. Uh, and as long as it's not preceded by a Y or a J, then that also will be uh, fourth, uh, fourth division, and therefore type A. Then the other type, type B, is uh, identified, a type B syllable always has either Y, or, the J or Y before the vowel, or else the vowel is I, or both, and you can have a, y, a J before an I in some cases as well. But that's the way you can tell the difference. Uh, it turns out, even though it looks like these are this is out of balance, but it actually turns out that there are about uh, that about half of the syllables are type A and half of the syllables are type B. Here's just some examples of type A, uh, division one. Guan official, well it's Guan, and I've given you the old Chinese, but you can just to look at it for now and don't worry about it. East Dung is T-U-W-N-G, uh, Nung Abel is N-O-N-G. Yeah, somewhere here I point out, I meant to point out, the O often represents an unrounded vowel. It's not necessarily rounded. Again, we did, just didn't have a suitable symbol. Uh, so in many of the environments, it may very well have been unrounded, as in this case, uh, which is probably Nung and not Nong or something like that. Um, here's a division two. Again, they all have A-E or E-A, and there's no Y or J in front. Uh, so, and uh, you can see that the the Division two finals usually cause a palatalization in Mandarin of the of the originally dealer consonant, although it's not there in Cantonese. For instance, this is just da, and this is just uh, I guess gai, uh, and so forth. But uh, and then bang is this, and guan is this, and so forth. Uh, all the division two syllables uh, are reconstructed with an r in old Chinese with an r before the main vowel. Uh, division four uh, always has an E and no, no J or Y before, so Qian is a D Z E N. Uh, fowl, uh, chicken is K E J. Interval is T S E T. Uh, first is S E N, and so forth. Another advantage, another selling point for this uh, is that 
if you get used to the Middle Chinese notation, it becomes much easier to figure out what the relationship is between Chinese and the Chinese loanwords in Japanese or Korean or Vietnamese. Uh, the, the rate relationship is much more transparent than it is between Mandarin and those uh, things. So that's also useful. Um, this is a third division. Uh, you can see that each one has a J or, or a Y or an I or both. This one has both. Uh, so strong time is something like G. A battle was something like uh, Jin, and uh, metal something like Kim. You can see this is just like uh, the Kim surname in Korean or whatever. Uh, again, you can peek at the old Chinese, but I'm not going to uh, uh, talk about it yet. Finally, the tones. Uh, we in indicate tones in Middle Chinese, uh, an X at the end. Capital X indicates Shangsheng. Capital H indicates Chusheng. PT or K at the end, of course, indicates Wusheng, the tone that with a final stop. Anything else is Pingsheng. And here are some examples from the numerals. Yeah, well, yeah, somehow this got repeated. Uh, that was late at night, I guess. Uh, to show you now how this uh, works out, how we get, we apply this to Old Chinese, uh, this is a, a stanza, well, this is a whole poem, in fact, a Zhou Nan, Fo uh, Yi from the uh, uh, Shi Jing, and it's a Cai Cai Fo Yi Bo Yan Cai Zhi, Cai Cai Fo Yi Bo Yan You Zhi, and so forth. Uh, notice the poem is very tightly uh, constructed. The only thing that's different from one stanza to the next are the rhyme words. This is a particular subtype of, of poem in the Shi Jing. And these are the rhyme words. Uh, in Mandarin, you've got, well, these two work okay, Duo and Luo, Jie and Xie, they still rhyme in Mandarin, but Cai and Yo don't rhyme, okay? Uh, and then even in Middle Chinese they don't rhyme, but here is what they are. Cai is written this way in Middle Chinese. Again, the, uh, the second and third stanzas rhyme okay in Middle Chinese for... Uh, but uh, even in Middle Chinese, the first stanza doesn't rhyme. And this is, begins to be a clue as what the differences are between Middle Chinese and Old Chinese. But you have to start from knowing what the... In, for example, to interpret the rhymes, you have to um, start by understanding which uh, Middle Chinese forms can rhyme together and, and under what circumstances. Is that the end? Yes, there's another, the second part is the uh, uh, historical background. But, uh, let me see. Just close that. Any questions before I go on? I've been, yes. Um, I understand that the Middle Chinese, as you said, is a, um, not really an ancestor to exactly something. Still, in the family tree, how would that be placed as compared to the Min dialect? Hmm? How, would, how would, would that be placed as compared to the Min dialect? Oh, well, we know this. Uh, that, that is, we, as I said, there are distinctions which are preserved in the Min dialects which have been lost in Middle Chinese. So we know that whatever happened, I mean, it, it's not too hard actually to, do, to write a set of rules that will de derive most Chinese, modern Chinese dialects from the Middle Chinese system. I mean, exactly how it corresponds to, true, to the actual changes is something else, but you can write the rules. But for Min, you cannot. Okay. Some of the information that is preserved in Min is already lost in Middle Chinese, and so Min has to be a sister to Middle Chinese rather than a daughter of Middle Chinese. And that it explains its importance uh, for Old Chinese because, and, and it, it's, as I say, it's a bit odd that uh, uh, more attention hasn't been paid to the Min dialects. Well, it's not odd in the way that it's, it's really hard, it's really complicated, and uh, we, but we are hoping, at this point, I think in version uh, 1.0, we will have a, at least a notation which will tell you, uh, from which you can predict what the min, min form will be. Is that, is that right? We hope. Okay. <laughs> um, but that's, that's what we can say about that. Now, actually, the Min dialects may not be the only such case. 
because there are a lot of sort of out of the way dialects up in the hills and various places in southern Hunan, in uh, Shanxi province in the north and so forth. There's a lot of weird stuff going on in there which has not necessarily been figured out. Uh, and so when those dialects are properly studied, it may turn out that other dialects, uh, Cantonese also has some things which uh, uh, may not be explainable from uh, Middle Chinese. But at the moment, the most obvious such case is the Min dialects, where, where it's very clear uh, and it's been studied. Anything else? Okay, what time is it? Quarter past ten. I'm supposed to start stop at 10.40? Oh, we're doing okay. Okay, so this part is historical background, uh, sort of how we got to where we are. I simply list here uh, the names of a number of uh, uh, well-known uh, Chinese scholars of the Qing Dynasty, whose uh, contribution to the study of Old Chinese is uh, really tremendous. Um, and uh, they uh, one of the things they were trying to do was to, uh, well, they weren't really trying to reconstruct Old Chinese for the same reasons that we were. They wanted to know uh, how best to interpret ancient texts, or they wanted to be able to figure out where uh, there was more than one reading in a certain passage, uh, which reading was likely to be the correct one, and things like that. So it was mostly a philological um, interest, but they looked at they surveyed the rhymes of the Shi Jing and other uh, early, early poetry, and uh, they identified classes of uh, uh, words that rhymed together in terms of uh, de the classes defined in terms of Middle Chinese categories, which, uh, uh, as I say, that's one of the reasons for needing to know Middle Chinese. Um, and uh, as time went on, their analysis got more and more fine-grained. So there were uh, Dai Jun's, uh, I don't remember exactly how many categories, that's, that's actually in a different chapter in my book, but it's in chapter four if you happen to uh, want to look. There's a summary of this, not necessarily a ter terribly sophisticated intellectual history of all this, but there's a summary in chapter four. Um, and uh, uh, as time went on, the number of categories went up. That is, they, as time went on, they tended to recognize additional distinctions that they hadn't noticed before. Uh, if you think about it, uh, if you're reading a poem, as we just were, and you see that it doesn't rhyme in Middle Chinese or in, in, or in Modern Chinese, but it does obviously rhyme in the poem, that's very noticeable because you will see that it fails to rhyme. So if the, uh, the things that used to rhyme together but don't anymore are easily detected, What's difficult to detect is cases where things rhyme now, but they didn't rhyme before. Because you can read the whole thing, all of the rhymes will seem fine, you will not notice that they fall into two categories that don't overlap. In order to establish that, you have to look at the whole corpus and you can't discover it by just looking at a single poem. So that's the reason, I think, why uh, they didn't immediately arrive at a, a satisfactory set of uh, rhyming categories for Old Chinese. And uh, we'll say more about that later. Uh, just This is a kind of a comment on uh, traditional Chinese phonology. Um, I'm, I always uh, want to be very polite about these guys because they were you know, intellectual giants and so forth, but uh, I do have some criticisms of the, of the way they do it. At least for our purposes, it's not, uh, not ideal. The uh, notation is categorial rather than alpha alphabetic, as you would expect. So they would say things like, think something moves from the zhi group to the zheng group, okay? uh, where we would say it moves from shua to shua ing, something like that. So if you, look at, if you do it alphabetically, you can see what stayed the same and what changed. At least you have uh, a, a symbol for, for those things. Uh, but it's not, it's not easy to figure that out from the traditional categories. And this sort of goes through the whole the traditional terminology. There are some, uh, there's a lot of phonetics involved too. There is, um, in the rhyme tables especially, there's phon sophisticated phone uh, uh, phonetic analysis that was not matched in Europe until the 19th century. Uh, it was influenced by Indian uh, uh, ling uh, linguistics, but uh, 
but still, a lot of it is like this. It says it's, it, it, this group and this group have some kind of relationship, but you can't tell what the relationship is uh, because it's not spelled out, as it were. So it tends to be ab abstract and non-intuitive in the sense that you can't intuitively get a, a, a feel for what happened unless you're really, really familiar with the categories. I think it's also fair to point out that these guys uh, had little knowledge of other languages other than Chinese. Uh, some of them may have known some, but uh, of course they probably know, knew various varieties of Chinese, but uh, they were not in a position to uh, decide what was a plausible historical change, a sound change for a language or linguistic change, uh, and that also is a weakness, I think. So, uh, the next step is Bernhard Kalgren, Galban Han. Uh, this is he. Uh, I don't know that I would want to have dinner with this man, but actually my teacher did have dinner with him uh, and said he was quite a nice guy, but he, anyway. So he wrote a dissertation, doctoral dissertation, called Etudes sur la phonologie chinoise, uh, and uh, it was translated in 1940 as uh, into Chinese by four uh, famous linguists. Zhong Guo Yin Yun Shi Yan Zhou is the title in Chinese. In 1940, uh, he published Gramata Serica. That what he'd done before was on Middle Chinese, and uh, also included a kind of dialect survey and looked at uh, the so-called Sinozenic loanwords. Uh, but this was his now an attempt at what he called archaic Chinese, which is what we call uh, uh, old Chinese. In 1940, there was a review of the book by, uh, and which makes interesting reading by uh, Zhao Yanren. Um, in the Harvard Journal of Asiatic Studies, partly in, in response to that, who we might not have admitted it, I don't know, is a revision of, of uh, Gramata Serica in 1957 called Gramata Serica Recensa, or GSR. Uh, that has been translated also as a very useful Chinese translation by Professor Pan, uh, Pan Wu Yun, who was at our meeting a few days ago, and, uh, and others. Uh, one of the advantages of this book, by the way, is Krogan will say that such and such a form is used as a lone, lone character to write such and such a, a word in, say, the, the Shangshu, but he won't, or in the Zhuozhuan. But he won't say where in the Zhuozhuan this happened. So, bless their hearts, the Chinese translators, uh, they try to track down all of these passages, and they actually quote the passage in which the word is used in the sense that that, uh, that Karlgren claims it was used. Some of them they couldn't find, probably Karlgren just made a mistake, uh, and of course some of them are, are probably controversial, you could interpret them other ways. But in some ways the translation is better than the original. So to sum up Karlgren's contributions, he introduced phonetic notation which I, I am realizing more and more I should really emphasize as an important thing. It's sort of like substituting Arabic numerals for Roman numerals. Uh, it really makes a huge difference to be able to do that. Um, he began uh, comparative dialectology. Uh, some, uh, there have been some literature on dialects in, in Chinese, but not from the uh, modern point of view. He actually recorded a number of, of uh, dialects based on field work and and he wrote dictionaries, translations, and glosses, which are still very useful, uh, and uh, I, I use them all the time. Uh, but uh, his archaic Chinese system, or, or old Chinese, uh, has a number of uh, problems with it from our point of view. First of all, he reconstructed a very unnatural phonological system for the language. Uh, basically, the point, the point is that Karlgren believed in phonetics, but he did not believe in phonology. And so uh, he thought he was, I mean, he would, he, all sorts of vowels are in complementary distribution with each other, and any modern linguist would have considered them varieties of, you know, allophones of the same phoneme. But uh, he thought they were pronounced differently, and he once said that, uh, uh, that this phonemic business, this craze for phonemics was nothing more than a game in which you tried to write the sounds of a language with as few symbols as possible, preferably none other than to be found on an American typewriter. And I'm sure Carlgren did all of his stuff by hand. 
so that's one of the problems. Uh, he didn't ad adequately explain the Shi Jing rhymes. You can't really tell uh, unless you just memorize. Uh, which of his forms are supposed to rhyme with which. Uh, that's a big problem. Uh, in, during Carlgren's lifetime, in 1937, Wang Li, the Chinese linguist, discovered the distinction between uh, these two rhyme groups, Zhi and Wei, uh, and everybody had accepted this, as far as I know, except for Carlgren. As far as I know, he never mentions it, and he's, he did not accept this. But this was a, sort of one additional uh, distinction I mean, a uh, more fine-grained analysis of old Chinese rhyming. There were another set of distinctions, the so-called chungnyo, which uh, I can tell you about later if you're interested in. I, don't, I won't go into it here, but there are uh, distinctions marked in the rhyme books very clearly, uh, and also in the rhyme tables, and they even have different reflexes in some dialects, but uh, he did not think that this was a real distinction, and so he failed to make this, these uh, distinctions. Uh, this is a set of slides, probably for uh, linguists, it's, uh, it's unnecessary, but I'll run through them anyway. The point is, if, as you know, vowel systems of natural languages show a certain kind of symmetry. They're not perfectly symmetrical necessarily, but they do show a kind of uh, a pattern. This is Spanish, this is Japanese, just like Spanish except long and short, or maybe there's more other ways of analyzing Japanese, I don't know. Classical Arabic, three vowels long and short. French is a little bit more complicated, but basically it still has a kind of structure uh, with nasalized vowels and so forth. Uh, one possible analysis of modern Mandarin would be something like this, would have this vowel system. I won't try to argue for it, but that, that would be one way of doing it. Well, here's Carlgren's archaic Chinese over on this side. The dots indicate short. Uh, shortness because there's already a hat on top which you can put a breathe over. So this is long, short, long, short, long, short. Those are the, and, and this I guess is long, short, and long, short. But the sort of random which va vowels have uh, the length distinctions, uh, they're, anyway, you can see that it's unbalanced. Uh, I, the, what's over here is the, the uh, notation that's used in the tr uh, Chinese translation. They substituted IPA uh, notation for Carlgren's rather idiosyncratic notation, um, and that's what you come up with. Uh, here's an example of what I mean about the problems with analyzing rhymings in, uh, uh, rhymes in, uh, in uh, his, the Carlgren's reconstruction. An an with a circumflex over it rhymes with a regular an and a short an. Uh, short UG rhymes with schwa G, but short UG does not rhyme with long UG, which on the analogy of these other things you would expect it to do. So it's, again, it's sort of hit or miss, and uh, uh, even though we wouldn't want to claim that, uh, if, yeah, uh, if you see two words rhyming, I think it, you can't really claim that they must have had the same main vowel, but I think it's uh, a it, we certainly would try first for a system which was based on on that kind of, on identity of main vowel. So it would be desirable to have an analysis in which all of the words that that rhyme together had the same main vowel in coda. Uh, if, if that's impossible, it may be, maybe the conventions for rhyming are more complicated. But but uh, anyway, this is not possible with Carlgren's system. After Carlgren, uh, uh, well, this is still in his lifetime, but as I say, he ignored most of it. Uh, Wang Li, as I said, uh, introduced a new distinction. Dong Tong He uh, came up with a basically revised Carlgren system. If you're going to use a Carlgren style system, I really recommend Dong Tong He rather than Carlgren. Um, it's a lot like his system, but it's better. Uh, and then Aubrey Coeur, in 1954, made proposals on the origin of tones, which uh, argued that uh, old, Chinese tone, uh, old Chinese did not have tones, that the tones came from uh, lost consonants. So I just collected a few pictures of these guys. Here's Wang Li, revered in China, and justly so, although uh, reverence can go too far. I tried to find a picture of Dong Tong He, um, but I could not. And uh, actually, I'm, I'm working on it. I don't know what he looked like. Here, as many of you may know, is uh, Audrey Coeur in a characteristic 
pose and gesture. Okay, then next step, around 1960, 59, 60, uh, uh, about that time, there were two new players on the field. Uh, Yachentov, uh, uh, who was in uh, Leningrad or St. Petersburg, and uh, Pulley Blank, who was, was at the University of British Columbia. Uh, both of them came up with very inventive ideas. Some of Pulley Blank's inventive ideas had actually been invented earlier by Japanese uh, scholars, but uh, which he acknowledges for the most part. But uh, uh, anyway, this, there were some new ideas that came in, into play at this time. And I've got pictures of these guys, too. Uh, actually, to the, left, to the right of uh, Yachentov in this picture originally was Sergei Starosty, and I have a better picture of him later. Uh, but, uh, and then this is Ted Pulleyblank. Um, and then a very important development was uh, Li Fangui in 1971 published a, a book called uh, Shangu Yin Yenzhou, or it was a long article first and then a book. Uh, this was a great improvement over Karlgren's system. It incorporated some of the uh, new ideas that Yachentov and Pili Blank had come up with, although not all of them, and in my, my view, not enough of them. But uh, it was very influential, and uh, that was, uh, I think, the best uh, reconstruction system, and many people still use, it's still widely used. Uh, Laurent and I both uh, started our research basically on Old Chinese with this system and uh, found things that we wanted to modify about it, uh, but, but this was our starting point. Uh, it is also still uh, inadequate in some ways, I, uh, in spite of the fact that he was a great guy and all that. Uh, it's sometimes said that Lee's system had four vowels, and there they are, but there were actually seven units which function as vowels. Uh, because in addition to I, schwa, U, and A, you also had these so-called vowel clusters, I, schwa, I, A, and U, A. Uh, it turns out that, uh, that the distribution of these is such that you can reduce the number of, of vocalic units, if you like, or, or nuclei, to six, from seven to six. And this was independently done uh, by three people, uh, Zheng Zhang Shangfang in China. He may have been the earliest. Uh, didn't, wasn't that stuff done in the Cultural Revolution? Sergei Starostin and uh, me, uh, and uh, certainly I was uh, helped with this with, by my teacher, Nick, Nick Bodman. Um, and uh, well, you can, it's satisfying to come up with a proposal and find out that two other guys somewhere you know, far away in the world have come up with virtually the identical proposal. The, the, uh, the system is very, very similar. Uh, systems for all of, all of these are very, very similar. And uh, here is uh, Zheng Dong Shangfang. Uh, uh, this was in Shanghai last uh, uh, December 2005. And uh, Sergei Starostin, to our great uh, uh, sorrow, uh, died in uh, 2005 at a, at a young age. So, uh, the next major milestone, of course, not well, anyway, I wrote a book in 1992, uh, a rather heavy and expensive book, and I haven't gotten a penny out of it, I assure you, so far, uh, in which I, basically what I did here, now, uh, for one thing, I think what many people find, have found useful about the book is that it, it, it explains in English some of this stuff about the background of Old Chinese and Middle Chinese, which had not appeared in English, or if it had appeared, it was in an outdated form or not in one place. And so that's one of the convenient things about the book. Uh, I also proposed a reconstruction system, which uh, I think uh, includes many small uh, improvements and it works pretty well, but the truth is that very few of the ideas about Old Chinese were original with me. That is, what the six vowel system, I guess, was, but again, it was also invented by these two other guys. And actually, all three of us, I believe, were influenced by Yachentov. I mean, Yachentov sort of set us on the road to thinking in the terms which led to the six vowel system. Uh, so in my, I tell you what I think the, the uh, uh, contribution, the major contribution of the book, the central contribution, is that I, is this, the, the six vowel system uh, makes predictions, or at least it, it suggests hypotheses 
about rhyming, and in particular, it suggests that the, uh, the traditional analysis of Chinese rhyme categories, even though it had uh, gotten to be fairly fine-grained, was still not fine-grained enough. And that, for example, one of the rhyme categories, the yuan category, which is usually reconstructed a-n, according to uh, the six-vowel system, uh, in the yuan, traditional yuan category, there are words which we have to reconstruct with a-n, and there are words that we have to reconstruct with e-n, and there are words that we have to reconstruct with o-n. In other words, there are three different vowels in that. Now, you could claim that, of course, that there was just sort of lax rhyming and a-n and e-n and o-n could rhyme, but at least it suggests that uh, maybe uh, rhyming distinctions were overlooked. So what I did is I figured out a way uh, probabilistically to model the situation, uh, the, the null hypothesis would be that these different, uh, the things which the six vowel hypothesis uh, said should be different, uh, the null hypothesis is that they all rhyme freely and there's no problem, and uh, I figured out a way to test that. Uh, it's a fairly involved mathematical argument, and I don't think that many people have really read through it, uh, but ironically, that's the part that I think is the, is the most uh, important part of the book. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this was uh, reviewed by Laurent in Diachronica, and uh, this was, uh, in, in my view, the, by far the most careful and uh, thorough review of the book uh, that appeared. And uh, although it was uh, positive in, uh, in, in many ways, there were some criticisms that, uh, that Laurent raised about the book. And one of them in particular, let's see, does this come next? No. Uh, was that uh, I had not paid sufficient atten attention to morphology. And then, uh, well, I, uh, life moved on. I, I spent some time here working. Actually, Laurent and I published a joint paper on Chinese uh, word formation in 1998. The, his book, the 1999 book, had probably already been finished by then, right? Yeah. yeah. But it came out in 1999, and uh, the characteristic of this book, too, was to uh, emphasize the importance of formulating and testing explicit hypotheses about the morphology of Old Chinese. And that was something that I had not done sufficiently in my book. So uh, here's the, the state of play at the moment. It now appears that there are fewer reconstructions of Old Chinese than there are people investigating Old Chinese, which is progress. Uh, uh, that is, it used to be sort of that everybody in the field had their own uh, personal reconstruction. But there are a number of researchers working with the same set, basic set of assumptions. And if you were here during the journée, uh, if you heard uh, me and Pan, Pan Nguyen talk, you could see uh, uh, how that worked. I mean, Pan's uh, uh, has, is working with a reconstruction system which sort of looks looks fairly different from ours in, at first glance, but from a logical point of view, it's uh, it's very very similar to ours, and it's uh, uh, basically a revision of Zhang Zhang Shangfang's. Zhang Zhang Shangfang is, and uh, Starus was, of course. And uh, the other thing that has happened is that uh, Laura and I are now working uh, together on reconstruction. And uh, it, I must say that it has been a great pleasure. And uh, I think uh, we've done better than either of us would have done by ourselves. Um, yeah, well, I put this, I already mentioned this, but as I say, his main criticism of my book was the lack of an explicit theory of old Chinese morphology, and he was right. Uh, and I think to understand this, think about in Indo-European uh, studies, uh, there developed a theory of Indo-European roots where they could be full grade and uh, zero grade and, all, and O grade and all of this kind of stuff, and it depended on the, the affixes that were uh, added. Uh, that made a lot of made a lot of sense of, of Indo-European, uh, which had not been uh, worked out before. Uh, as you can see, uh, we this is us hard at work. Uh, I show this in every presentation. So, uh, gee, how my, how's my time? I'm probably running out. 
Okay, well, I'm, okay, go a little bit farther. Only a few more slides. Um, three, in fact. Uh, so here's a, what we had done already to 1999. As of 1999, one of the distinctions which we I have, don't think I mentioned is there. Uh, basically, I think it was Pulley Blank's contribution originally was to identify a separate set of lateral initials. The L in Old Chinese doesn't go to Middle Chinese and Modern Chinese L. Uh, that comes from R, but there was also an L and a voiceless L, and it came in type A and type B varieties. Uh, so we had accepted that. A lot of other people had as well. The six main vowels, as I said. Now, the, one of the keys to the si making six vowels work is recognizing that there were cluster, initial clusters with R, and that the R often uh, uh, condition certain changes in the vowel that followed it. Um, and the, the Middle Chinese uh, vowel system, which however you look at it is more complex than the Old Chinese system, uh, partly arose through the fact that there were distinctions, uh, there were effects, phonetic effects or, uh, of R on the following vowel, and then in most contexts, or at least after grave initials, the R disappeared, so there are no more uh, clusters, and so the, the distinctions, the effects of R, which had been probably allophonic at first, became uh, distinctive, uh, the conditioning factor having been lost. That's a lot of the story. Um, it, it has, we had no tones, uh, this is basically following Audricourt, Middle Chinese tones reflect loss, uh, glottal, a lost glottal stop or s at the end of the word. We had a set of the following set of codas. You see, this is a bit odd here. I, I, I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. Uh, but and you'll notice there's no corresponding w ing, which uh, is interesting. But unlike most reconstructions up to this point, there were no uh, final voice stops like b d and g. Uh, the Audricourt theory makes that unnecessary. Uh, and we had recognized, uh, oh, sorry, we had recognized the importance of morphology. Uh, we already uh, were talking about prefixes and infixes in our uh, joint article, for example. And uh, in his book, uh, Laurent had uh, talked about the, the fact that uh, you sometimes have, seem to have a minor syllable in front of the main syllable, uh, and there seems to be variation. So you can you can have. Uh, well, let, shall we say zero grade and full grade of the uh, of the uh, pre-syllable, uh, and sometimes then these lead to different reflexes. Um, so, what's new now? Well, uh, we use schwa instead of barred i. Partly, it's just because uh, schwa is more conventional and traditional. More pe people are uh, who haven't wouldn't recognize any other phonetic symbol if they've worked on read about old Chinese. They'll know what a schwa is. Uh, mostly. Uh, we have a different theory of the type A, type B distinction, and that is that the type A were pharyngealized uh, initial consonants. Uh, so the difference between type A and type B, Carlgren had attributed it to the fact that he argued that uh, the type B syllables he reconstructed with a yod or uh, uh, y-glide in front of the main vowel. And in my book, I followed that, and in uh, Laurent's book, he followed that, uh, and in our article, we followed that, but uh, there are a number of uh, reasons to believe that's not uh, especially a good solution. Uh, and Norman wrote this article, which I guess we'll talk some about later. Uh, we will put this article up on our website also for the, for the uh, summer school, because I think it's a very important article. Uh, our notation for this at the moment is kind of non-committal. We wanted it to be visible. Uh, right now, we are doubling the first letter of the root to indicate that, that it's uh, in this type A category, which might have been pharyngealized. I think we're beginning to convince ourselves that, uh, that it really was pharyngealization. It may very well have been pharyngealization, as Norman says. And so we, I'm warning you, we may change our notation perhaps as soon as version 1.0, and simply put in the uh, I in uh, there someplace. And then the other, another main change is we have a set of uvular initials uh, added. This was originally Pan Wu Yun's idea, 
Our, our uh, version of this is slightly different from Pond's, and I think it's an improvement, uh, and it's some interesting things going on there. Uh, we've introduced Dakota R. This basically follows uh, Starriston. In, in his book, Starriston had said that there was a, an R coda in Old Chinese, the normal development of which was to N, a uh, coda N, but in some dialects to uh, Yod. Uh, uh, actually, I think we've identified which dialects it were. They were uh, their dialects in and around Shandong province. Uh, it's a ver it's very nice. So we're trying not to set up any dialect distinctions which we can't lo locate somehow geographically. Uh, so and we have other new proposals on old Chinese dialects again tied to places in on the map. Um, we are also attempting now to, in a systematic way, to account for modern Min dialects, as I mentioned, and we're paying more attention to paleography and excavated texts. Uh, we have some new ideas on the early script. Uh, Laurent basically, I guess, uh, uh, came up with the idea that, in some ways, the early Chinese script was a uh, like a syllabary. Uh, I guess. To make people less nervous, we're calling it a quasi-syllabary. But I think learning the old, old early Chinese script is very different from learning the modern Chinese script. And people tend to think about the old, early Chinese script anachronistically, I think. Uh, that it, We can talk more about that if, if we need to. And uh, so this afternoon will be the Theory of Word and Root Structure by Laurent. And that's... That's it. So we're supposed to take a break now, and yeah. And then if you have questions, we have an hour's of, uh, discussion time before noon. Nine book, uh, translated uh, by Gongqin, uh, who was from University, and then to. Uh, I've been to China twice in the last couple of years, and it's on every bookshelf, in, in every bookstore, to uh, an unbelievable extent. Um, huh? Yeah, I didn't ever go to a bookstore where it was not there. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and uh, uh, my book is also being translated into Chinese, and uh, Inshallah, will appear in uh, uh, a couple of years, possibly, and uh, so who knows whether it will enjoy the same success. <laughs> okay, so uh, Laurent mentioned that uh, the audience seemed to be rather quiet uh, while I was going through all of that, and we don't like that, so. Uh, uh, we encourage you to uh, really to feel free to interrupt us during the presentations, but now certainly uh, we want to hear from you. <laughs> Maybe I should have put it differently. Does anyone have a question? <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, it's a little bit of a specific question about the main dialects. I wanted to know if you can elaborate on their okay. non middle Chinese. Oh, okay. Um, well, let me see. Um, I'll open this up and I can, I can show you on the screen. Uh, there's actually a bit of confusion. Uh, uh, it is considered, well, for instance, uh, let's see, that's a good word with, does pig have, is that T-R? Yeah, 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 pig, I think, in uh, me and, well, actually, let's yeah, look at the database. Word, word okay, let's look at the database. Um, uh, no, that's probably not the thing to do. Um, well, in old Chinese, there were, uh, well, if you, if you have Middle Chinese, this is just an example of the kind of thing that tells us that the uh, uh, that Min cannot have come from Middle Chinese. So in Middle Chinese, we have a final uh, A-E, which is in the Ma rhyme, okay? Um, and it has two, Chinese, uh, two Old Chinese sources. Um, 
It comes from, well, this is a type A, so we can write it with a double consonant. It comes from that, and it also comes from this. Now, this is the so-called yubu, fish. And this is so-called kubu. Uh, so, <clears throat> what actually happened here is that uh, in the main development that leads to Middle Chinese, this AJ thing uh, was uh, monophthongized so that in general, well, Ge itself, for example, uh, well, we're not sure about the initial, I think, but uh, we can do it that way. Ge itself is the, uh, let's do it this way. Uh, like this. So, um, this, uh, as I say, when I, the forms without asterisks are, uh, and without tone marks, are Middle Chinese. So this is the Middle Chinese, and this is the uh, the uh, Old Chinese source of it. Um, this, so this J got lost in this environment, and uh, that's part of probably what contributed to the merger of these two uh, things here. But in Min. Uh, the uh, the gebu still in the colloquial layer of min, that is in, the, in true colloquial words that have not been borrowed from other dialects, uh, you typically have, uh, well, in southern min it's y, other kinds of min it might be i, but the j is still there in, in min dialects. So uh, if you were just, well, let's see, what's a minimal pair? Well, a minimal pair is... Uh, and I don't know if these actually work in in Min, but so this is Jia. And uh, then the other Jia to add. Um, I don't know if I need. Uh, it's possible we have uh, brackets around some of these because we, we haven't, <coughs> in all cases, distinguished between, been able to distinguish between dealer and uvular initials. But in any case, this is more or less the situation. Uh, let's see, maybe I can find the, this. Uh... And what's the. Oh, I'm sorry, this is uh, home, and this is add. <laughs> what the mean word, right? Hmm? What is the min reference for that? Oh, the min, well, that's what I'm, I, I mean, this is an example, a, a potential example. I'm not sure if it's an actual example because uh, we don't have all the min forms uh, entered here, but let's see if we have something. Well, let's see. I'm sorry, I'm not, I don't think I can bring up an example, but I think that uh, I, I think one example is uh, uh, the word more to grind. Okay. This is actually MA, uh, and this is this, and uh, in uh, Xiamen, uh, I believe this is moi, and this comes from an earlier moi. That that W in front is characteristic of uh, having had a a uh, uh, dental at the end of a dental coda. So I'm afraid I, I don't have the min date on the on, at my uh, immediate disposal. But the the thing is that. Uh, this merger did not happen, and even in, and also with uh, in words like this, this is just this is just like that, except a different uh, initial consonant. Uh, there are Min dialects uh, which preserve the final J. Okay, the normal reflex here is, is I. Mm -hmm. Here, the top there. Yeah, this would 
Yeah, in, in some in proto men, something like this, this comes out as. Uh, uh, so, 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 so. Which one are you talking so. about? Oh, sand. Yeah, yeah. Another another one is uh, uh, Sha. And this is proto men, something like uh, Psy. Uh, another example is uh, well, there's a set of forms. This is in so called Duo Hu, uh, which is uh, words ending in Ak. So we have words like, uh, well, let's see. Well, let's find some. Yeah, I know we can do it. All right, so here's an example of a word uh, to jump over, pass over. It's not necessarily a very common one. Or let, oh, I know, okay, here's good. Uh, a good example is uh, Ruo. Uh, this is like if and uh, little Chinese, it's nyak. And uh, this comes from knock, okay? Uh, and shi, stone. Let's see, I'll, I'll put glosses here in case you know. Uh, is a shi from... We've just got a D there now. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> now, so... These two words uh, rhymed in Old Chinese, and uh, for some reason, uh, this one comes out with this. This is actually uh, remember is actually uh, sorry N Y plus Yak. Okay, so <laughs> for some reason th these are both type B. Okay, and for some reason we have. Uh, two reflexes in type B. Uh, the similarity in the characters, by the way, is accidental. They're not connected. Uh, so sometimes we get J-A-K out of, out of type B in, in this uh, rhyme group, and sometimes we get J-E-K. This is also like that. Uh, and we haven't, it appears to be conditioned by the phonological environment, but or, or well, actually, we know it differed in different uh, dialects, uh, but for the time being, we haven't identified the, the uh, exact conditions which distinguish these, so to keep the uh, predictability of the Middle Chinese forms on the basis of the Old Chinese forms, where it has this reflex, uh, we write it with a capital A, just indicating for some reason it has this other reflex. So, um, but in the so this um, merges with uh, so basically Middle Chinese type uh, B I should say this and uh, so there's a merger in Middle Chinese between uh, this ak. Mm -hmm and an ek, they both come out the same way because of some kind of fronting process. It, it, it only happens after uh, coronal initials, but there's some coronal initials where it doesn't seem to happen, and so we're not quite sure what's going on. But in Mian, uh, so this is an innovation in Middle Chinese, uh, the merger, a partial merger here, I mean a, a merger of, a merger of, uh, J, of AK and EK, but in Min, they are still uh, separate. So the Min word, uh, it's a southern Min, uh, Shaman, word for stone, is, uh, well, call it a glottal stop in tone eight. So it's Jiu. Uh, it has a back vowel, as it had in, in Old Chinese. And so these are still separate. So those are two cases where mergers have occurred, which are therefore innovations in Middle Chinese which are not shared by men. 
So they're illustrations of the fact that we can't uh, derive min from uh, from Middle Chinese. Now there's also a whole set of phenomena at the beginning. I think I can call these up for you. Yeah, for example, the word uh, Chang, long, now we don't have the full forms, but uh, uh, Norman reconstructed the proto min uh, initials, uh, and he, in addition to T and D and aspirated T, he's also got hyphen T and hyphen D. So, I'll go back to this. And he may have changed the way he writes these, but in the early stages it was this, and then this, and this, and this, and this. And, and hmm? and yes, and DH. Yes. Uh, so, uh, these are only one, two, three, four initials in Middle Chinese, uh, but in Min, uh, the, the ones with the hyphen in front are so-called softened initials. Uh, and in one group of the subgroup of the Min dialects in the, what's called Northern Min, or some, it's in the Northeast, uh, dialects like Tian O and uh, uh, Tianyang, Shibei, anyway, there's a whole bunch of places uh, where uh, the softened initials have uh, different reflexes. And uh, again, let me go back to this, and I think if we uh, keep going here, we'll get to some good examples. Yeah, okay, well, here's a little bit. Uh, in the Shubei dialect, so, so this word for pu, which in the Middle Chinese is D-R-J-E, is reconstructed in Min with a softened D. Uh, and one of the reasons is this, that in Shubei, you have a contrast between voice and voiceless initial consonants, but it does not correspond to the distinction between voiced and voiceless in Middle Chinese. It cross-cuts that distinction. So what happens is that it is the softened T and the softened D that give you D in Shibe. Okay, so this form here is evidence that the middle that the proto min initial should be hyphen should be the softened D. Uh, now uh, Jerry Norman noticed that some of the words involved uh, are also present in Hmong Mian, uh, Miao Yao, in other words. Uh, presumably borrowed, borrowed into Miao Miao, and that they often have uh, prenasalization in, um, in Hmong Mian. Uh, and he speculated that that might have been the cause of it. Our account is, at this point is a little different. We think that these softened things actually had a, a, a full presyllable in front of them so that the consonant was in intervocalic position and weakened in intervocalic position, or in this case, voiced in intervocalic position. Uh, but, uh, so, the D and the hyphen B, the D and the softened D, the T and the softened T are not distinguished in uh, Middle Chinese, but they are distinguished in these Min dialects in a fairly consistent manner over, over not a terribly broad area, but a, a region of Fujian. So, uh, that's another thing. Then also, well, the DH is another thing. Uh, this is actually a, a fairly new idea, but um, we think this uh, comes from an M prefix, well, some kind of dental, uh, um, some kind of dental here. Actually, an intermediate step would be And uh, since the, the M has the uh, effect of voicing the following uh, stop, so uh, we can't tell in general whether the original stop that was after the N was voiced or voiceless, uh, 
they do contrast in Hmong Nyan. You have pre-nasalized voiceless and pre-nasalized voice. But um, it has been puzzling in, even in this, not in north, northern men only, but in other parts of men, you have contrasts between, well, between uh, aspirated and unaspirated reflexes of uh, uh, voiced uh, uh, stops and affricates. Normally, I mean, Middle Chinese had a voiced series like uh, B, D, G of initials. And uh, each dialect seems to have its own rule for what happened to these. The voicing is still there in the form of a murmur or something. It varies probably phonetically in the dialects around the mouth of the Yangtze, the Wu dialects. Still have a three-way distinction between T, TH, and B, for example, in initial consonants. Uh, but in most varieties of Chinese, the D has merged with the other two in some fashion. So in, uh, let's see. Uh, well, uh, an example is uh, uh, I'll take an example from Mandarin. I don't remember. I'm going to write this up without checking the thing. Okay, so we have this uh, means to transmit, and this means uh, probably something transmitted. So it means something like uh, a, uh, well, sometimes it's used for biography, a narrative, uh, etc. So here's a case, by the way, I mean, getting a little ahead of ourselves, but. Uh, uh, this is a case of an S suffix which appears to make a noun from a verbal root. So, in Middle Chi in Old Chinese, the difference was you had this thing, as I say, D can come from a lot of things, so I'm just putting it in square brackets, I'm not sure. But uh, the difference was that the verb had no suffix and the noun had an S suffix. And the S suffix uh, eventually became an H and it caused the tongue to be depressed and so the uh, uh, the S form went into the uh, let me say out there here. This is a Chu Sheng, and this is a Ping Sheng. Um, so we have one form in Ping Sheng and another form in Chu Sheng. And the Chu Sheng forms are or come from a final S. Uh, so in Mandarin, what happens, uh, this is one of the voiced initials you know, of Middle Chinese. It's a re retroflex D, we think. And uh, so if it occurs in Pingsheng, then it's aspirated in modern Mandarin, and it goes to tone two, which is what we have over here, right? Uh, the CH is the aspirate initial. If it's in any tone other than Pingsheng, then it will be unaspirated, that's this, uh, and whatever the tone reflex would be. Uh, in this case, a uh, Now, But each dialect has its own way of treating, if, if a dialect has lost the, uh, the voiced series, each dialect has its own way of treating them. So that, this uh, aspirated in ping shang, unaspirated everywhere else is, is characteristic of uh, Mandarin dialects. But uh, uh, Hakka dialects and Gan dialects, uh, the voiced initials were aspirated no matter what the tone. Um, then there are dialects like Changsha in which they were unaspirated no matter what the tone. The pattern in Cantonese is a little bit complicated, I won't go into it. Um, but in the Min dialects, some of them go to uh, aspirates and some of them are unaspirated. Uh, and it's been uh, difficult to figure out why. So uh, Jerry Norman, who was going by modern dialect evidence and not, not, not the rhyme books and things like that, reconstructed for proto-men 
a D, which would come out as the, uh, when it was uh, un, a D voice, would come out as the unaspirated one, and DH, which would come out as the aspirated one. But we didn't know whether this D and DH should be projected back to, middle, to Old Chinese, because it appears in Min, or what. And we now think that uh, uh, Min D is just from earlier D, well, which itself has a number of possible sources, and min D A, oh, sorry, D H comes from M. Uh, shall I write a hyphen? M D. Question about this. So if you uh, sorry. actually, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hang on just a second. If you suppose that there is an X. This is your capital M2. Okay. Or L, right? Or L, or double L. This should actually be like this, but... No, I don't know about that. Anyway. All right, so... So, if you suppose that um, there has been a prefix M, for example, is this due to the fact that M uh, or um, uh, the labial prefix can call voicing, or is it due to comparative data, for example? Do you have examples, or do you have um, related words um, in which you um, reconstruct with an M prefix mm -hmm. in uh, Old Chinese or in other dialects, etc.? So, which which is the, the basis for this hypothesis? Well, it's. Uh uh, it, the argument is fairly complex, yes. but uh, let me see if I can. Uh, yeah, why don't you take that, and I'll be calling up some examples. Here. So actually, we, the, what happened is that we first reconstruct the nasal prefixes without thinking about mean, and after that, we realized that the prefixes that we reconstructed allowed us to. Uh, give an account of the evolution of mean. So mean is not part of the evidence that led us to reconstruct. I see, mean. but it's a, it's a result. So. Yes. The uh, well, uh, I think this was this is in my book actually the reconstruct of reconstruction of capital N reconstruction of two yeah, nasal prefixes yeah, know, is in my yeah, book. And the so there is evidence the, rec the evidence for reconstructing one of them as M is that it's long, the long, it, it's, as a verbal prefix, it's, we, we think it's a volitional prefix. Mm -hmm. And as, as all, all Chinese prefixes, it has two variants, a short one and a long one. And the long variant appears as M, mm -hmm. as M, actually. Yeah. We, have a, we have an example of the long variant appearing as M. Also, uh, we also have examples of this M, of this volitional M occurring before initial R, in which case it will give you middle Chinese M. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the evidence for reconstructing okay. an M there. Yeah. Uh, there is support for reconstructing a, a nasal, in that this M is also picked up by early loans to Miao Yao, so you see the nasalization yes. there. So that's the, that's the evidence for reconstructing M, uh, bilabial M. Yeah. And, and in this particular thing, I mean, the, the um, <laughs> what, what was the generalization about the, the voice to ask for it to me? Right, so, uh, Jerry Norman once observed, so after reconstructing his six problemine, six types of problemine initials, Jerry Norman observed the, uh, made an interesting observation about devoicing. You see, yeah, they, two of these, uh, two of these uh, kinds of stuff, the, the plain voiced ones and the, and the aspirated voiced ones, the de and de, you distinguish them by their reflexes in, in southern mean, or maybe in all of mean, in all of mean. Yeah, I think it's all of mean. Uh, one set, the, the de, the normal, kind devoiced to T, mm -hmm. and the DH kind 
the voice to TH. Mm -hmm. And he made the interesting observation that Xirongzi adjectives or stative verbs mm -hmm. never devoiced as th. Okay, never never mm -hmm. went aspirated. They always devoiced as, as unaspirated. Mm -hmm. Now this makes good sense in terms of the in terms of our reconstruction of a nasal prefix, mm -hmm. a capital N prefix mm -hmm. uh, for uh, for for intransitive verbs, mm -hmm. of which stative verbs are a subset. Uh, the way Jerry Norman looked at it was that he, he was asking the question in terms of general Chinese dialectology terms, which is, what happens in dialect X to the middle Chinese Chanzhuo initial? So that's that's if you do Chinese dialectology, the, one of the main things you do all the time is check what happens to the to the voiced initials of middle Chinese verb the yeah. good. So he, he saw that in Min. Well, there was one set going to unaspirated, one one set going to aspirated, and he's. Uh, now, if we look at if we look at this in, in, in the same terms, uh, in the terms of my uh, of my book of 1999, there can be two two reasons why uh, a singlongzi, a stative verb, has that is a stative verb which has a uh, which has a voiced initial in Middle Chinese, can come from two sources in Middle Chinese. One source, it's an original voiced stop. Okay, no prefix. Yeah. And the other source is that it's a voiceless stop which has been voiced before Middle Chinese by capital N. Alright? Now, if we suppose that in Prolomene the two sources as merged as 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 B D G while the other well, well, well the other nasal prefix, the M prefix, mm -hmm. had not merged with that. Still not merged. Either it was not voiced yet, or it was voiced but preserved by the, 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 um, I think I need to, to write. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so we suppose that these these two guys has merged as D, but this was either either not 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 voiced yet, so MT, or voiced but still preserved, still still with a, a, a nasal prefix in front, in front. So that's in fact that's the that's the situ that's the interpretation we're favoring now. So this would be MD or ND. Okay. Now, if you assume that there was there were two rounds of devoicing in me, in the first round of devoicing, these guys devoiced, but those did not devoice mm -hmm. because they were protected by the, by prenasalization. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then you will have the desired result that is that all the xinongzi will devoice here. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So all the, so you suppose that uh, this did not devoice until later. Mm -hmm. So these devoice, did not devoice until later. At some point they became D, and then DH, and then and then TH. So this would be a much later kind of yeah. devoicing, yeah. and possibly a devoicing taking place at the same time of the devoicing in Hakka and Gan, just mm -hmm. nearby, which also devoice yeah. in that way. Yeah. Okay, so that's that would be our explanation A of the devoicing and B of the, the peculiar. Yeah. Pattern that we find in Min, that mm -hmm. Norman observed in Min, and also of his his, uh, his observation that all the synonyms, mm -hmm. all the stadium verbs, voice as an aspect. So the point is uh, that you, you will not have a uh, an adjective or an intransitive verb. Well, at least not an adjective mm -hmm. or a stative verb with a, with an M at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So that would explain yeah. this distribution. Yeah. And there are. Let me show some examples of this. 
correlation that he was talking about. Oh yeah, I guess we would. <laughs> uh, I called up a few. Well, here's one, for example. The word do for gamble uh, is in uh, is reconstructed with a. Uh, oh yeah. is reconstructed with a, a softened T. Uh, this means it would come out in, uh, I don't have the form, but it should come out in Shube with a voiced D, even though the middle Chinese is a T. Okay, so as I say, the, the voicing in Shube is orthogonal to the voicing in middle Chinese. So that's what they reconstruct, and this is on the basis of different reflexes in the northern Min dialect. Well, down here we have the Yao word for bet or wager is B-O-U, okay? Uh, now, uh, Yao, D, a voice initial stops in, in Yao, or in Mian, in other words, uh, have all come from pre-nasalized stops. Uh, it's whenever there's a cognate in uh, Hmong, or that is Miao, uh, that will have a uh, pre-nasalized stop. So, this is a well-known uh, fact or hypothesis about these. So this indicates pre-nasalization. Yeah. Now this doesn't necessarily indicate pre-nasalization for us, but it, it, the, uh, the softening in this case, since it didn't, didn't follow the path uh, Laurent is talking about, this is why we put a schwa in here. So M schwa T would explain this. Mm -hmm. So that's the, uh, the uh, iambic form of the word. And M Without a schwa, T would explain uh, this. Mm -hmm. So let me get another example or two. Here's an example of uh, the end pages. Uh, okay, just a minute. Um, this is a this is a especially nice form uh, mushroom. Well, we are, we know in even in Mandarin we have mogu here. We have a prefix uh, mm -hmm. on it. Is this okay? Yeah. So Middle Chinese, this this uh, character is just read KU, no problem. But again, in Mit in uh, Min, it's a, a a softened K. Let's see what if we've got any more data. Yeah. So this is typical of the uh, Northern Min reflexes. In uh, Zhenqian, instead of a K, you've got an H. In Jiano, you have zero. Jianyang zero. Wufu zero. Uh, Fuzhou K. So Fuzhou is not in the Northern Min group that we're talking about. And uh, you can tell it's not just the consonant reflexes, but the, uh, the softened initials in uh, Northern Min also have uh, distinctive tone reflexes. So this is fairly, this is solid, that, that whatever the softened K is, that's one of them. And uh, then if we go back, uh, uh, this is a reconstruction of, I guess, proto Hmong Yan by uh, Wang and Mao. Uh, and they reconstruct the pre-nasalized, uh, I mean, the mm -hmm. things look funny in Hmong Mian, there's no, uh, I mean, there's no, no getting around it, but this is pre-nasalized in uh, Hmong Mian, and mm -hmm. it's believed to be a loan word from uh, Middle Chinese. Uh, now we want an N. Wait a minute, I think I had a couple of other good... good. Oh yeah, this is, that's cool, let me get that. Oh, here's, by the way, an example of what I was talking about. Uh, this is uh, Malai. Okay, this is this means snake. Uh, she. This is a uh, Middle Chinese. The vowel is also anomalous here. We're not sure why, but it's clear that it it, it rhymes as if it were a j, and, and that's the ge bu okay, that I was talking about. And then the uh, Norman reconstructs here the whole syllable. Softened voiced initial, and then I open uh, back ah, uh, and then an, uh, an I. So that's the I at the end that I was talking about in Kuo. Um And uh, this initial, uh, well, again, we have uh, both forms here, and there are, in this case, uh, cognates. Uh, or comparanda, at least a proto loloish word for python is lie. Uh, let's see. Uh, we've got a few other things there. 
And, uh, <coughs> well, a Proto Austronesian word for snake is gulai. Just <laughs> keep that in mind. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. So now let me find some capital N's. And with something in the min field, I guess. Okay, well, this is one, yeah, Chang. So this has a D in Middle Chinese, that's why it has, and it's Ping Chang, so that's why it has an aspirated initial in Mandarin. Uh, in Min, it has a. Uh, it's no good? Never mind. <laughs> Let's take another one. <laughs> no, I think this. Uh, I think actually we haven't figured this out. I guess that's all we can say. Uh, now here's it. Is this one good? <laughs> Is this one okay? Yeah, this one's good. <laughs> okay. Uh, except that this is. Uh, well, this, this is not the. Uh, this is the fused form, and not the. Yeah, this one has an N because there are other forms of this which have voiceless initial to this root, uh, I think. Yeah. Uh, so that's not especially helpful. Well, anyway, it's an example of, a, uh, of an intransitive verb or adjective which has this N prefix. Uh, one of, so one of the ways we can detect an N prefix is as with, well, at least one good thing about Chang was that it is, was an adjective. Mm -hmm. yes. And, uh, and it also has uh, related forms which have a voiceless initial, like Zhang, elder, and things like that. Um, here's the straight. Is this one okay? Yeah. Yeah, another one. Yeah, this is uh, what Lauren was talking about, where you have, uh, again, it's an adjective, meaning straight. Um, uh, well, it may in fact be, actually it's difficult to know the, the etymology of uh, da da da, but one theory is that it's uh, the same root, as, or it's a re related root to this, uh, that basically is derived from the idea of straight. Virtue. Virtue, yeah, right, virtuous. And uh, it's sometimes written with an I and a straight line coming out of the I. In fact, that's, what we, that's where this comes from. Uh, and so this doesn't. This uh, is fused here. The N T came out as D in men, no problem. Uh, if it, if it had been D H, then we would have a problem. Uh, here's one. Uh, I think actually we have to put a schwa in here, Laura. Um, but but uh, this too, this uh, xian is. Uh, we have to put a schwa in Chang also. What? We have to put a schwa yeah, we have to put a schwa in Chang also. Uh, but uh, the, uh, this is written with the same character and is plausibly the same root as Tian, meaning in between. Uh, I mean, the idea being leisure time between tasks and things like that. Um, and uh, so this one, yeah, it should have a schwa here to, or an optional schwa anyway, to account for this. This is a softened initial in Yin also, although uh, it's not written with a hyphen for, for not very good reasons, but it, it falls into the same category. Uh, slippery, smooth. Again, we need a hyphen, a, a, a schwa here. We were just fixing these uh, last night, and we didn't get to all of them. Um, uh, hua, uh, notice. Well, I won't go into the Mandarin, but it's uh, slippery smooth, another adjective. Um, and uh, there's the softened initial, so it is probably from in schwa. And here we have proto hmong in pre nasalized. Uh, maybe I should search for the ones that have here and here. And there. Is it possible in your machine, in your search machine? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'm searching, well, this is why we did it this way, right? We're, so we're searching for something that has an N in the prefix field, anything in the min field, and anything in the Hmong Min field. <laughs> Three items. We've probably looked at them all already. No, well, Zhao is another. This is nice. 
Uh, again, this one we, we did fix up right. Another adjective. Um, and, uh, well, I didn't put it here, but the min initial is uh, hyphen ts. And you can see uh, Tianyang, uh, one of those dialects, has an L initial, which is not the usual reflex of TS. Uh, we believe that comes from the intervocalic position, okay? uh, and in, but it, it also makes sense that it should have a, a, a capital N prefix because it's an adjective and that's typical. And uh, sure enough, in, this word is borrowed into uh, Hong Mian. Uh, the, this is not a terribly good reconstruction of uh, Hmong Mian, but uh, it, it's accurate as far as it goes. And uh, it, it, Hmong Mian has this word with a, with a pre-nasalized, voiceless stop. So that's a, unfortunately all I seem to have on those, but... Okay, it's a... Yeah. Um, I have a practical question. Yes. So if this version, version one, Point zero is coming out. Yes. Is it accessible in the internet? Can can we have all these lovely examples just? Uh, well, the, yeah. the plan is this. Um, first of all, the, uh, I recommend this FileMaker Pro software. It's very nice and it, oh, it's okay. available for both Mac and Windows. Um, it is possible to uh, have a uh, a real time uh, you know accessible online version generated from the database in principle. Uh, the people at the University of Michigan won't let me do that because of yeah, security problems. Uh, so it, it leaves a hole that somebody could get in. Uh, what we plan to do though, it, it is easy to export data here in, the, in HTML format. So once we get, once we've decided which forms to release and once we've made our final decisions, we can uh, sort the data in one way, export those uh, forms onto a table on the web, uh, and you can uh, look it up that way, and then we can we can have several tables. In fact, uh, I mean, I'm not sure. You know, three thousand rows in a table. I'm not sure how that's going to work, but uh, we can also have it sorted in basically in any order we want: uh, Middle Chinese, Mandarin, Radical Stroke, whatever. So that's our plan. Uh, the so the the uh, the introduction is going to be a small book, I guess. I don't know whether we'll have a, a web version of that or not, but uh, uh, the release of the examples for now will probably be on in, in that manner. So uh, this illustrates basically, as I said, we really are still in the process of, of uh, applying this theory consistently to the MIN data. We don't have all the min data in that probably that we could have. We need to add some more, uh, and we need to see if this uh, how well this works. But so far, it seems to work well. Uh, another, uh, well, I'm not sure exactly what the what's going on here with Ming and Ling. This is the same case where Laurent was talking about where we have MR. Uh, one way we can tell that the sub, that the prefix in question was an M is because we have forms where the M survives, such as this. Yeah. Um, by the way, I don't think anybody else's, well, I won't say anybody else's, but Li uh, Fang uh, Carl Gren, uh, those guys, uh, maybe Dung Tung could not explain the relationship between these forms. And as you know from, they're basically interchangeable in early texts. Mm -hmm. Uh, we seem to have two uh, forms. Well, oh, I'm sorry. This is a command. This is also a command, <laughs> uh, and uh, it's difficult to know for sure exactly uh, when you see a, this character. One of these characters written is difficult to know for sure which form is being written, uh, or for all we know, it, the noun. Well, it can be a noun or a verb, right? Uh, we don't know whether... Uh, it, it could be that the noun form has been generalized now in, in the reading tradition so that you always read it as if in Chusheng, even when it's a verb. Uh, uh, the, there are Pingsheng readings of this, but I don't remember exactly what they mean. 
Uh, but this would be a case, the reason I put this in uh, brackets is we don't know what combination of things would have led to this, but one of the possibilities is M schwa hyphen R I N G R I. Well, this is repeater names of it. Um, by the way, uh, um, if you looked at excavated texts, there's a very curious thing, which uh, uh, is still a mystery, but in one of the Shanghai texts, I think, it seemed that on the same, that this root at least occurred several times on the same strip, and there were these two little marks underneath, not, uh, not for Chung uh, Wen or whatever, but just two, two little marks, when it was a <coughs> verb and not when it was a noun, or vice versa, I don't know. Uh, and so there are these, you do find in the excavated texts that there, sometimes there are little forms added to a character, and it's usually described as, uh, uh, what is the term anyway, decorative <laughs> <laughs> strokes. Um, and maybe they are decorative, I mean, there certainly was a lot of variation in the writing system, but it is possible, it is conceivable, that sometimes this was used to mark different forms for the same root, because the same, the, uh, the basic uh, way the writing system worked was that you, that a character would represent a root, okay? And you could tell from, the con a, a native speaker could tell from the context how to read it, uh, whether, whether, which form of the root it was, just as an English speaker can see R-E-A-D and read it as read in some cases and read in other cases. Um, uh, but in some, especially as the, as the morphology, morphological processes began to die, uh, you can imagine that they might have made notes as to how uh, such and such a form was to be read if it was not if the process was no longer part of their actual speech. So that's it's very intriguing. I'm not claiming that that's what it is, but I don't know what else it is. Someone else? Time time to stop. Well. Um, Okay then, well thanks for your attention and we'll see you at uh, 2 o'clock.